now call the meeting of the Silver Falls School District Board of Directors to order. Everybody is here, so we have a quorum. And uh, we are going to first move into executive se session under ORS 192.6602H to consult with counsel concerning the legal rights and duties of a public body with regard to current litigation or litigation likely to be filed. We should be back uh, at 7 o'clock for the open session for anybody who is in the audience or waiting online. Thank you. I now call the board back to open session, and our next agenda item is the agenda review. Is there a motion? I move to approve the agenda as published. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as published. Debbie, would you be able to take the vote? Jonathan? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Janet? Yes. Owen? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Lori? Yes. All in favor? All right. Um, our big item tonight is the Bond Adv Advisory Committee draft recommendation. Thanks for all of you who are in the audience. I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Great. And we're going to have uh, one of group come up and our two Bond Advisory Committee members as well. We can have a seat, and Celeste House shall be invited up here as well. So, uh, thank you, Board, for for having this on the agenda tonight. Uh, I believe I had said in a uh, presentation last August, this past August, that. Uh, January would be the time where we'd bring a draft proposal to you. Um, uh, Wenaha Group will walk you through that. Uh, before we get into that, I just want to make sure that in a public setting, I, I give my deepest gratitude to the th our three board members who've been observers. Uh, and not just observers, but also active participants, not committee members, but active participants in the process. And so Owen Von Flew, Janet Alanak, and Jennifer Traeger, uh, I've sat with Jennifer at each one of the, the four meetings and it's, it's truly been a pleasure to work with this group. Um, as you know, we spent a long time putting together really thoughtfully this list of committee members that we felt truly represented Silverton uh, and the Silver Falls community and, and what I've appreciated most is the, the really spirited conversations that have gone on and, and certainly this last meeting fit the bill. Um, I also want to uh, shout out to Lauren uh, Stanley and, and our support group, Brett Davison, Steve Nielsen, Debbie Valoff. Um, all have just been tremendous behind the scenes uh, to prepare for each meeting. For a, for a two hour meeting, we're talking about a lot of hours of prep, 15, 20 hours of prep that go into each meeting and really being thoughtful about all the questions that are asked during the process making sure that for each and every question, we have thorough answers as well. Um, and as you know, the goal of all of this, of course, in the long run, is to hopefully find a way to reconcile the, the desperate needs of our facilities. But remember, the goal that I have is for the board to take confident action um, on this bond recommendation this spring. And so I'll talk about next steps as we get there. But. Um, Having said that, I wanted to also thank Cassie Hibbert and Dale uh, Kuykendall for their uh, support during the process. Cassie has been our lead facilitator, has been doing a tremendous job, and, and Dale's been right there with her the whole way. Um, it's just been an absolute pleasure to work with Wenaha. They're a top-notch outfit, and they specialize in districts like Silver Falls. So having said that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Cassie. Welcome. And at the end, we're going to have, at the end of the presentation, we'll have our Bond Advisory Committee members, uh, Dixon Bledsoe, Hillary Dumitrescu, and Celeste Richardson um, is probably on her way. Take it away. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not used to the screen in the sky here since we've had the room set up differently. So I may peek over <laughs> Scott's shoulder a little bit. <laughs> Okay, um, well, what, uh, so first off, so pleased to be back in front of you tonight, um, and uh, as we promised, this is where we were scheduled to be for January, and we are back here to report to you on draft recommendation. 
So um, what we're going to do tonight is first we're going to walk through the process and the timeline of the work that we did over the past few months, um, looking at what we did on each one of our BAC meetings, and Winaha will update on that. And then actually as part of the presentation, we're going to turn it over to our bond advisory committee members to present the recommendation because it is their recommendation. It is not Winaha <coughs> Group's recommendation. It was developed by your bond advisory committee. And I know that they're very pleased to be here tonight. Um, their hands shot up right away when we said, can we get some volunteers for next Monday? Um, so to take a look at where we are on our overall process. Um, so this all started back in August when we came and we saw you in work session and then in September in your regular board session. And we looked at the same graphic um, and kind of talked about how we were going to map this out. Um, and back then, um, we also did a state of the district poll where we kind of got the lay of the land as well. We also did some more polling later on in this process. And after we finish up our presentation tonight, Jeremy Wright from Wright Public Affairs is going to join us to talk you through the more uh, recent poll that we did to help inform our back decisions. So we saw the back in October, November, December, and January, and now we're back to see you tonight. Um, and then when we finish up tonight, we'll go back and look at this slide again, and um, probably I'll turn it over to Scott to talk about next steps. Um, so this slide just shows um, all the people that went into the BAC, of course. Um, uh, at the top is the constituency of the Silver Falls School District and you as the board of directors. Bond advisory committee is in the middle uh, with 21 members. And then Winaha and Wright Public Affairs as supporting, um, as well as our school board observers, um, who Scott already recognized, and then our district support staff, who are subject matter experts um, on what's going on in the district. Um, on the right side of this, you can see the attendance. We had pretty good attendance from that group. Um, just unfortunately, there were a few people that had out-of-town conflicts, but they were right back for the next meeting, so I feel like we had really good continuity through the process. And also another good time to shout out one of our other supporters, who's Debbie, who you all know how awesome she is, uh, taking notes in all of the meetings and then also getting that out to all of our BAC members so they had reference material to refer back to or if they missed a meeting, they could fill themselves in. Um, so um, for BAC number one in October, this was sort of a, a get to know you meeting. Um, we were building on the results of the Long Range Facilities Planning Committee, and so this was basically getting this new group together, getting them set on their mission, kind of crash course in the district, and just hitting the ground running. So in that meeting, we established ground rules for the committee. We adopted the charge that the uh, board appro approved for the committee. We reviewed the process, that same timeline graphic that we just showed to you. And then we did a couple exercises to talk about the uh, BAC members' initial impression of the facilities. Um, we also talked through uh, the polling that had been done early on, as well as getting up to speed on all your long-range committee planning work to date, right? We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. There'd been a lot of work there, but we needed to get people up to speed on it and basically ready to roll. Okay, from here, I'll turn it over to Dale to talk about BAC number two. All right, it was kind of an informational download evening. Um, so several folks prepared information, brought it to the BAC to bring everybody up to a common level of understanding of the conditions of the district. So uh, bond history, uh, going back to your previous attempts and even the, the earlier passages that helped build this building. Um, uh, went through that, went through the operational budget for maintenance. Steve presented um, statistics about how much actually goes into the buildings every year. Part of that was to help people understand that a maintenance budget cannot build new buildings of any any kind, really. Um, that's what bonds are, are necessary for. Um, the middle school condition challenges. This was an um, interesting segment, and Brett was deeply involved in it. Um, they prepared a video walkthrough of kind of a typical day at the school, and I don't know if you've had a chance to see that. It was on YouTube in a select we that distribution mm -hmm. at this point. Um, but that, that told a good story to the bond, the BAC committee. 
Um, we looked through a replacement um, design concept and how it was phased. The next slide will give you a, a quick preview of what that looks like. Um, looked through kind of overall district needs, some project lists that were developed through the facility assessment that was done not too long ago and kind of showing um, you know, what that list looks like and what the needs were at the other schools. <clears throat> Got a lesson in how uh, general obligation bonds work. Had a call in from Lauren Sanders with Piper Sandler and she walked us through all the bonds and statistics and provided some numbers on some potential bond amounts that the community could consider. Um, this was kind of the fun part. We showed some slides showing a potential layout of a new middle school at the same site. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is what we call the replacement uh, concept and it basically um, positions the new construction at the north end of the site to minimize impact to the students and school operations to allow the construction and operations to continue at the same time. It takes about four phases to accomplish um, but it's a, a you know safe and effective way to get a project done. Um, and that was kind of kind of BAC number two. Thanks for letting me steal your iPad. <laughs> That's a team effort. <laughs> okay. Um, so then moving into BAC number three in December, now we started to get into the options. We'd been doing a lot of conveying information up to that date. This was when we turned it around and really started to have our committee members talk. So we went through a couple different exercises with them. One of our first questions was, should a bond be focused on one project or should the money be spread throughout all of the district schools? And that was really the first thing that the committee came back unanimously and said, we want to spread the money across all of the district schools. And so that was a very, I think, powerful first decision that started to frame how we talked about it afterward. Um, we did a preliminary vote on the middle school replacement. We had about 90% of the committee raise their hand and say they were in favor of replacement with a few members that were still had some questions. And one of the questions that got brought up was, would it be possible to save money by doing a remodel of some of your district buildings rather than just an outright replacement? And so we recognize that that is a very good question. And so we set aside some time between BAC number three and number four to explore that in a little bit more detail. Um, and one thing I do want to just clarify about that question, I'm going to go back to the previous slide, is the, the district in this replacement scenario is already being frugal by keeping your main gym and your locker rooms. You're doing that because you have to because you did a seismic upgrade on them a few years ago and part of that is you say to the state we're going to keep these in their use for 10 years so you're already keeping some of your existing building that question was just could we keep more of your existing building um, so um, we'll talk about that in a second but we did did explore that as a as a good question um, that um, I think is based upon the desire to be frugal in this district and be very careful with money. So we wanted to honor that request. Um, also as part of BAC number three, we had a discussion of if we should include any potential projects at the high school in the bond recommendation. Um, even though we still call the high school the new high school, it is 20 years old at this point, some of it even older than that in the first phase. And when you get to a building that age, there, there are some things that need to get done on it. So in particular, we looked at a roof replacement, HVAC controls replacement, and a chiller replacement. All three projects have been designated as critical by maintenance staff that if they did fail would significantly affect the operations of the building. So we considered that as a committee and had some pretty robust debate over that one as well. Um, and then finally in BAC number three, the committee worked together to create a definition of what we called warm, safe, and dry. And that was basically a, a baseline for all of your schools across the district on um, very critical building infrastructure to keep your buildings viable and operational from a long-term standpoint. And what the committee did is they went through an exercise on potential projects and then rated them in order of priority. 
um, following BAC number three, what Winnaha did over the Christmas break in conjunction with our architectural partner was to basically go through and then put um, pricing and details um, to the priorities that were created in BAC number three. So to go to the next slide, we'll kind of show you what this looked like. So this got developed between BAC number three and BAC number four and then presented to the committee in BAC number four for part of their decision making. Um, and so uh, I mentioned that the, com the committee worked to take individual projects and, and sort them based on priority. So what you see in this slide is there's pink projects. Those were rated as very, very highest priority. In fact, all of our uh, committee member tables rank those as very highest. The green was just a little less highest than the, than the pink. Then the yellow was down to a, a middle priority, and the orange was the lower priority. And I don't want to imply by saying lower priority that they're not important. We were just doing an exercise where we had a force ranking to basically have some sort of sort there. Um, and then you can see over on the right-hand side, and we'll talk about this more when we have WPA present the polling results, but we also did polling between BAC number three and number four to help the committee um, be informed on community feedback as they developed their draft recommendation. And so those tiers on the warm, safe, and dry, along with the cost of the middle school, which we saw on the other slide, the middle school at 75 million, basically created three different tiers of um, potential prices. So the first tier would be um, $26 million of warm, safe, and dry projects, plus a $75 million high school for a 101 total. Um, and and uh, so we pulled on that one. And then the second tier of polling would be both the pink projects and the green projects, plus the middle school. And then the third tier of polling was basically all of them. And those were created basically to give us some different prices so that we could then go out and test some price sensitivity with the community and then be able to bring that back to the BAC to inform their decision making. Okay, so then BAC number four was last Thursday night and this is where we kind of wrapped all those disparate elements together. Um, so what the committee did in this meeting was they reviewed the pros and cons of the replacement, um, sorry, the middle school replacement versus the modernization, which I mentioned. And I've got some notes on the slide about kind of how that shook out. The replacement, which is the slides that we showed you earlier where you build the new school on the north and then demo the school, the old school on the south, that is about a $75 million project. And it's also four phases, which seems like a lot, but when you build a new school on an existing site, you've got to have an empty chair, so you always have somewhere to put your students. And that was about a 28-month schedule. The modernization scenario that we explored, which was um, keeping your gym, as I mentioned, and then keeping your east and your west wing of the 60s buildings at the middle school, and still demoing the 1938 building, which is partially condemned, that, saved you a little money, 68 million, but it increased your schedule to 40 months because you, again, need to have an empty chair to be able to move those students around, and it turned it into six phases. And I'll let our uh, committee members speak to that in a little bit more detail, but the reasons why the committee thought, yeah, we're not sure if that's kind of worth the money, was the longer schedule, the additional phasing, and the disruption to the education, that it didn't honor the long-range committee's work that had developed the replacement scenario to begin with. Um, and then big ones were that it missed opportunities to design the space to actually optimize the building footprint and that it retained the inefficiencies that you've already got on that campus. One of the other compelling points, I think Celeste brought this up, was that if, if we went with a modernization and it took 40 <laughs> months that we would have middle schoolers that would never know anything but construction during their middle school experience. So that was just a, that was a compelling point that one of the BAC members brought up. So. Oh, that's okay. Um, so then also in BAC number four, we reviewed the polling, which you'll get a preview of again later. And then we also re-looked at our warm, safe, and dry priorities, and then we reordered them based upon some of that community feedback. 
Um, and then at the end of the meeting, we settled on a draft recommendation, which I'm going to turn it over to our BAC members to describe. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was going to bring up, too, and we talked real briefly about it, is the warm, safe, and dry is a great model, but I always wanted to add one other component to it, and that is um, conducive to learning. And that was one of the things that was raised as a, a missed opportunity, uh, that uh, you know, having functional adjacencies and having something that is conducive to kids' learning Certainly being warm, safe, and dry is one of that, but also having the facility be conducive to learning is good. And one of the other components we talked about too is during that 40 months, if you go to an elongated schedule, um, uh, you also run the severe cost, and we, I think we touched on it real briefly on, it's gonna change, the numbers are gonna change over 40 months. Uh, it's instead of you know 75 to do the middle school it, it may grow quite a bit and that takes some of the construction out of uh, or some of the uh, benefits out of the equation because you have to cover the cost of inflation but uh, we uh, we really thought uh, it was paramount um, you know it, it sounds selfish a little bit but you know that whole what's in it for me model uh, you can't go, in our opinion, I think pretty much everybody agreed, you can't go out and say, let's just replace the middle school. Uh, because that's not going to draw a whole lot of votes from the entire district. Uh, and we talked a little bit about some of the pitfalls of um, if you really make a, a beautiful brand new super school, it also, you know, there might be some transfers to that. There might be some people that might want to argue about, oh, you know, getting into that whole concept of closing rural schools because you have a super school in town. We wanted everybody to get a piece of the pie. Um, we did have some uh, heated discussions on whether or not to include the high school. Um, and I, I don't think you can say everybody gets a piece of the pie if you exclude the high school where every kid in the district, one commonality is they're all going to go to the high school. Uh, so we thought that was really important. So um, Hillary, you want to, I could talk all night about this. Um, yeah, just to dovetail off what Dixon said, I think that, you know, one of the elephants in the room are the main misconceptions between rural folks and city folks, uh, for me at least, was this idea that, you know, well, there aren't that many kids at those little rural schools. And the, the, the real number is that a third of our kids attend rural schools. A third of our kids are in city elementaries and a third of our kids are at the high school at any given time. So we really do have an equal split amongst all of our school sites. Uh, so it makes sense then that all, it's not the school buildings that are getting the benefits, it's the kids. All of our kids deserve to go to a warm, safe, dry school building. And as you all know, because I know you've all toured the schools, every school in our district is in need of repairs. Uh, some of them really severe, um, but all of them necessary. And all of them will greatly improve the morale of our kids, the morale of our teachers, our staff, everyone uh, included. So <clears throat> whereas I started off sort of curmudgeonly in this process, um, I have become a big cheerleader to it, especially when you crunch the numbers. Um, so the numbers we decided to go with was, you know, we decided we're going to go whole hog here. If we're going to do it, let's do it. Um, and I use the analogy of, you know, there are some folks who uh, love old cars and I've got my grandpa's you know old 57 Chevy and I'm gonna take care of it and put money into it every year and maintain it and that is an admirable uh, endeavor um, it doesn't work really well with school buildings unless you're willing to tinker year after year after year to try um, I'm losing my I'm losing my train of thought I'm going the wrong way what I want to say is there are other people like me uh, who would just as soon 
buy a new car every 10 years and know exactly what I'm going to pay for, do the, the maintenance, I'm going to you know, take it in for all of its updates. And we're really looking uh, at the future of how we do things in our district and, and saying, you know, we don't want to do any more deferred maintenance. We don't want to have a competitive nature of our schools, you know, pitting little, having fights about who gets what. We want to take care of all of our buildings. So this package will get us off on the right foot of getting every school to a basic baseline of warm, safe, and dry. And then going forward, we want to get rid of that mindset of you know comp competitiveness between the schools. And we want to just make sure that we're doing that maintenance that we need every year going forward. What else do I need to say? Next. I got a couple of things. Okay, go ahead. Um, we talked about uh, a variety of things, and you can see on the right side there the uh, updated warm, safe, and dry priority list. And, like, it's a no-brainer. You've got basement and the flooding, I think, at Evergreen. Uh, but another message that I thought and we thought uh, is important to get out there is that for years and years the district has been beat up about deferred maintenance. Uh, Scott and I talked a little bit about that not long ago. And you, you put it off and you put it off and then it, you get into such deep kimchi that you have to then go out and ask for gigantic bonds. Well, part of the, the thought about adding the high school to the equation is first of all, the first part was built in 1998. That's 25 years ago. And as Owen knows as a builder, I know in real estate, is you have uh, things that you have to address and uh, you know a water heater lasts eight to 12 years. You know, it's in every inspection report I've ever seen. And when you have a 17 year old water heater, you know that at some point, any second, you're not gonna have water. So for the people who say, oh, they're just in trouble again because they've deferred, 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 one of the reasons for putting the high school in there is you're supposed to have stuff at a 25 year old building that you've got to pay attention to. So maybe this is a good time to start turning the message around uh, that we're not going to get into this deferred maintenance trap for years and years and then go out for great big bonds and sometimes get them hammered. It's an opportunity to say this is where we start not deferring. We have a roof issue, we have some HVAC things, I think there's some, a little bit of plumbing and electrical things. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I think is absolutely crucial, and Hillary said it better than I have heard anybody say it. It doesn't matter, my kids are in town, my grandkids are in town. Your kids are at Evergreen or Bethany or Butte Creek or Victor Point or Scotts Mills or whatever the rural school is. And the reality is there are kids. The reality is, is if I live in town, I want your kid at Pratham to succeed. If you're in Pratham, you want my kid to succeed because they're all going to end up at the same high school on the same uh, chess team, the same... Uh, basketball team they're all going to be going to the high school and Hillary's message was real simple there are kids and you know we can argue all the time about s people still holding anger issues about unification and people holding anger issues about oh you didn't tell us the truth on the bond in 1998 we thought we we're going to complete the new high school the reality is this is 2023. They're all our kids. They're all going to end up at the high school and we want every one of them to succeed. Dixon, I interrupt, would you, you told me the other day and I'd like you to tell everybody uh, your thoughts on the word new in high school. Uh, <laughs> yes, I have a definite opinion, although you know me as very shy. Uh, there are people that still say it, well, there was heated discussion about not including the high school because um, there's, there are some people on the committee and they represent parts of the community that think that the bond will lose be, if we add anything to the high school because there's still people mad about unification. There's still people mad about the bond being two bonds to complete this new high school. 
and they're still calling it the new high school. And I think in any of our messaging, we've got to get away from that word. It's not the new high school. It's a 25-year-old high school in parts of it, and what, perhaps 20 years in the other part of it? But our recommendations in this particular bond for 138 is you don't pass bonds easily, and everybody here knows that. It's really hard in this district. We still have a lot of uh, spit and fire in issues going on between the different groups in the committee or in the uh, uh, community. But this is an opportunity to get it right one time. And yes, it's a big ticket item, but let's stop calling it the new high school and we're not going to include that because our presentation and our agreement is that everybody gets something because everybody needs something. So yeah, new high school, let's get that out of our vernacular. It doesn't fit. I think we've covered some of these, um, but what the, the group sort of, uh, they asked us to brainstorm what the benefits were. Um, obviously every school, uh, every student at every school is going to benefit. Uh, it's worth doing it well. It's, you know, yes, we could go for a lesser amount, uh, but what we saw from the polling was that the amount didn't really change people's votes. Um, <clears throat> if it was 101 million versus 138 million, it wasn't like we suddenly saw people go, oh, 101 million, well, that's no problem. Uh, the folks who are gonna be sort of anti-tax um, are going to be hard to sway, but I am determined. Um, <laughs> we're gonna do it right once. Uh, we are asking a, a big ask here, but I think again, um, a big ask shows a big commitment. Um, it improves the safety in our district. If you look at that list, we aren't asking for Kashinu teachers' lounges or, you know, uh, ergonomically designed student desks. We're asking for things like plumbing and windows and, uh, you know, security systems. Uh, they're all things that are going to support our goals um, minimally. Uh, it shows that we're taking care of our kids, that we support the future of this district. My kids are both at the tail end of high school. They're not gonna see any of these benefits. I'm totally okay with that. Uh, somebody has paid for my kids um, their whole school career. The, the previous generation did that. I'm absolutely willing to pay it forward. Um, we're protecting our investment. <laughs> That's definitely something uh, Dixon mentioned a water heater. I had my first experience this year with knowing that water heaters have a life and that it ends. <laughs> um, I did not know that. Uh, so I'm still a new, uh, relatively new homeowner and learning those sort of things the hard way. So I'm, you know, we are, as a committee, we're listening to our district maintenance folks. They're the ones who were down in the trenches of these buildings every day. So we didn't make these lists up. This is what came forward from uh, the experts. Uh, we hope this project will unify the district. Unification uh, still is a, a, a thorn in the side of some folks, um, but again, I think it's just, it's just something that we have to welcome people to the table and keep having the same conversation over and over. Do you wanna take the other half? Sure, the right side. The right side. <laughs> Uh, a little bit about what I had mentioned earlier, we're not continuing to defer maintenance. Uh, Scott and I had an interesting discussion that at the district, there's no way you can ever keep up with maintenance from the general fund that you have. Uh, but the perception is in messaging going out and being able to say, uh, this is where we turn the corner on putting everything off because we're gonna start taking care of our biggest investment which is the high school. We're gonna start taking care of things now. Um, the other thing is improving teacher retention, especially at the middle school. Um, it's, it's pretty gross. Uh, in real estate, uh, I've had people back out, and I mentioned this in the meeting the other night, I've had people back out of buying a $500,000 house because they saw black mold. And even though I say I have a mold company that can come in and probably mitigate it for a thousand bucks, they walk away because black mold is scary. So 
uh, somebody on the committee had suggested getting people uh, in to tour it and even maybe having some of the kids show them and then they'll see that uh, you know there's issues with asbestos there's issues with uh, you can't see it of course but probably radon as well but black mold it terrifies a lot of people so walking through that uh, old school which was old when I went there uh, and that was a couple of years ago um, I think Eisenhower was just finishing up uh, but uh, being able to keep teachers at a time where it's absolutely crucial to keep teachers uh, and staff it also shows our commitment to kids it shows a pride in the district uh, nobody has a lot of pride when you walk into the middle school and you walk past the part that's condemned you can't go in there because it's really bad uh, and it reflects as a district and a town in the area it reflects our care for the kids that we have um, and it also improves recruitment uh, opportunities for the district that's really important because it's a tough time to get good people and having a good facility is certainly part of that so uh, okay, we got one more so after the committee brainstormed benefits they also brainstormed barriers and then potential strategies for addressing those barriers so yeah this is a big ask and it's going to take um, some convincing and as a former teacher I know that um, you can teach the same lesson uh, a million times but until the person that you are trying to teach is ready for that lesson they're not going to hear it um, so I think it's it's our responsibility um, as a community of supporters to try to have those conversations to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations as well as um, any conversations we can have in any of our, our groups our churches um, to sort of take that 138 million dollar cost and break it down into what it really is which when we look at the actual um, cost per household um, <clears throat> we used I think the number the figure we used was 300,000 of assessed value that works out to $38 a month in taxes $38 a month for what could be $50,000 worth of improvements for one student at at one school when we crunch the numbers this is what I like to call cheap money <laughs> you know you're, you're not going to find a better return on investment than what we're talking about here because I believe we are practicing really responsible stewardship with this money it's not going to fluff projects it's not going to risky projects it's going to maintenance projects things that should have probably been done a long time ago that we're catching up with um, so breaking those those numbers down uh, and, and we, we talked a lot about um, making sure that we have um, graphics that can go on social media one page handout so when somebody says well why don't we try to save those buildings at the middle school great question here's here's how we crunch those numbers we shouldn't be guessing about the questions that are coming in we shouldn't be surprised we should be ready for them um, there is something called an awesome grant uh, spelled O-S-C-I-M which basically is a reward from the state of Oregon that if you get your grant passed uh, or your bond passed they will give you a grant of four million four million um, so there's this great carrot uh, that's only right now um, so we, we definitely uh, want to talk that up in the community that you know we don't want to kick this can down the road because right now there's this awesome opportunity um, I talked about stewardship I really like that word that was a Sarah White uh, brought that term up because I think all of us rural city conservative liberal uh, I think we all want to be good stewards of the community's investments and their money and their time and their children um, so th to me this is good s stewardship um, educating the community on the history of the district's bond decisions Debbie did something great for us at our last meeting and provided us with some of the old material of the last bond that passed was it that one and then maybe one that didn't pass 
so that we could see the difference in the language. And this was pre-social media and everything, and we have so many more tools uh, at our disposal now. But I think that uh, reminding people why we, why we pass bonds. Um, there, so again, there's a big education piece here, um, but we have wonderful uh, information available to us. Um, let's see, besides that we're starting new patterns and new thinking, yes, we've talked about this already, and that we are a community that takes care of our buildings. Um, it is a bummer to uh, come into a city as fabulous as Silverton and then uh, go to the middle school and see it crumbling. Uh, my kids went to Community Roots, uh, as did Jen's, when we were still housed at the middle school. And it was a little disconcerting when we were, um, you know, sort of touring the facility and going, okay, so you can't go in that section because the roof could fall on you. <laughs> and you definitely don't want to go over there because there is so much black mold in that section. So, you know, there's sort of this, this rotten tooth at the center of, of that facility that really can't be ignored. And it's so out of sync with the rest of our community. Any, any rotting building material is out of sync with, with our community and our kids. Okay, I'm gonna do one more and okay. you take the rest. And oh, recognizing that the projects aren't gonna get any cheaper. We realize there could not be a worse time in the history of the world for asking people for money, except like maybe next year or the year after. Um, you know, uh, the economy stinks right now for most of us. Um, and these things need to be done, so. I'm gonna leave it there and you can take the rest. I'm gonna, I have to do it. I, I just, I can't pass up the opportunity to say this. Uh, the recognizing that the projects won't get cheaper. Uh, most of you were here, you know, when the high school bond was up. And a prominent member of the community, I won't name the name, um, for like jerky or really good uh, steak I might, but uh, the, the gentleman and I went around and around over a period of years and he said Dixon if they would just complete the new high school none of all these other projects in all the other schools if they would just complete the high school we would pass it that was when it and I might have the numbers wrong but that was when it was 17 million uh, and then it got hammered the bond got hammered and the next time this gentleman said same thing, if they would just listen to us, just complete the new high school, it's 33 million, just complete the, not all these other projects with all the other schools. And uh, so when it finally passed, and if I remember correctly, it might have been $49 million, it was only to complete the new high school. And he said, see, I told you, if you just listened to what we said before, just complete the new high school. And I said, what about all the other projects at all the other schools? I think it's important to message about it. it just gets more expensive all the time. But one thing, we started on the right side of the ledger here, uh, the barriers, the, obviously the one $138 million cost. Somebody's gonna recollect that, hey, we did the high school for 49 million. Yeah, that was years ago. This is a new day and age, this is 2023. As Hillary mentioned, the current economic condition is, is terrible, you know, the economy is struggling, there's all sorts of issues. The tax burden and the anti-tax mindset, that's prevalent. Um, uh, it doesn't go up a whole lot, but to some people, anything that increases is gonna be bad. Uh, and what we had talked about earlier, it bails out the past choices of deferred maintenance. Uh, so in concluding the st strategies list, um, we talked about having an emotional connection to the building. You know, there's, we mentioned that the old high school looks like Rydell High from Greece. It's really kind of cute, but you can't bring it back from its near-death experience. Uh, uh, remembering what it's like to be a kid. Uh, remembering that kids only get one childhood, and they're our priority in this district. Uh, this bond puts safety first. It talks about... Uh, uh, secure doors, it talks about better security systems, and we all know what that means in this day and age. Um, uh, the advisory committee can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with communities. We have a lot of people in the committee that are very well connected. 
Uh, the cool thing about, well, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, don't write off the no voters. We are one community. My attitude, and I think we talked about it on the committee, is you probably conceptually do have to write off some of the no voters because they're just flat out, they're not gonna vote for anything that, that cost them anything. So uh, as they talk about the polling data in a little bit, it's really encouraging that it's so close with the data at this point that even minor changes is gonna be really a pretty good recipe, we think, for success. Um, and another uh, strategy is the farm properties, they may have a special assessment for taxes. We didn't forget about that. We talked a lot about the farming community, the rural communities, and um, that's, uh, that is a potential barrier because you know I had some acreage listed a few years ago with 100 acres and the taxes on it were something like $200 a year. It was pretty small. So that is a barrier. It's a, a strategy that we have to adjust or uh, address. So. Um, so before we move on to next steps, I also want to take the opportunity to thank our bond advisory committee. You got a little taste of the discussions we've been having over the past four months, and you had a committee of really engaged community members that weren't afraid to have tough discussions and and kind of fight it out in a very respectful way and, and hear some different opinions. And I think just listening to what our uh, representatives have said tonight from, I mean, those were just kind of notes from verbatim discussions from the committee that we really wrestled through a lot of stuff and I think we're proud to come out of this with a recommendation for you tonight. So Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Before I go into um, next steps, I just wanted to ask our, our three board observers what you, what you just heard, um, to me at least, being, being intimately involved in the process and at every single one of the meetings was very representative of the, the spirited conversations that we had. Do any of our three board observers want to mention anything about their experience in the process? I'll just, I'll just say one thing, and, and that is to reiterate that the conversations were very robust and vigorous, um, but at the end of them, there was much more in common among the participants than there were differences. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some sticky differences, but it was really notable that with a very diverse group representing pretty much, I would say, almost every kind of different interest in the community, <clears throat> that at the end of the day, the priority of the kids, the priority of doing things properly, taking good care of our resources, um, being attentive to what community concerns would be, that was just throughout. So it was, it was a really, it was a great process. And I appreciate all the, all the, the, um, the committee members being willing to, to give their time because those were, those were you know, really intense meetings. And so I, rem I really appreciate those efforts. Thank you guys for representing it so well. That was, that was difficult to do. You, you really captured it, thank you. Yeah, well, well said, Janet. I don't have a lot to say, but I would just really piggyback on that. I think you, you really nailed it um, as to the way, way it happened. So thank you both, and thank everybody else. I just wanted to say thanks. Um, there was a, a sticky point where over the course of two meetings, one uh, bond advisory committee member was like, you still haven't proved to me that Replacement is better than, what was the word we used? Modernization. Modernization. And a lot of work was done in order to um, show what that would take. And it's really clear, I think, um, to me, that the modernization isn't good for our kids. Um, and so even though it was a lot of work and a lot of time to go through that process. I think that the whole committee was, was really clear on the reason why that's not um, what we're recommend or what's, what the bond advisory committee is recommending. So thank you for doing that. And thank you board members for being so, such active participants in the process as well. And uh, just for me as, as your public servant and a servant of this community. It's just been an absolute privilege to be a part of this process. I am in awe at the amount of ownership that has been taken by the Bond Advisory Committee. This truly is 
a problem so big it can only be solved by the community. And that's one of the things that it was so touching for me, um, being, being an outsider coming to Silverton and going into my third year here. Uh, it's just a real privilege to continue to serve. Um, I wanna walk through uh, what phase two will look like. So what you just heard up to this point was the end of phase one. And that is the bond committee work to get us to a draft recommendation. And so now we're going into the most difficult part of, the, of this bond process, which is the community engagement piece. And so as you know uh, from my board updates, um, uh, my weekly board updates that, that we're going into this phase that we're bringing in a professional facilitator to help us with these sessions so that we can remain focused on the types of feedback that we're looking for to make this a bond that our community is willing to support. And there's a lot of different technical aspects and strategy that goes into this to building a presentation that both informs the community and also solicits the right kind of feedback um, and honors all of the work that's been done. All, all told, if we get to November and if we get to June and the board feels confident taking action on this to place it on the ballot, this process will have lasted four years. Four years. That is a long time. Four years and three superintendents. Um, and so I think uh, I just want to mention that to put it in perspective. This has been a long journey and we're starting to enter into the second phase of of getting to a critical point. So the planning for these meetings, we have 10 of them scheduled. 10, I, and I would have to, to honor Steve's comments too. We are grappling with what to call them. Do we call them bond feedback sessions, draft bond feedback sessions, discussions? <laughs> we're working on that, but, but words matter. And, but I think you understand that these uh, are at a whole different level than last year's listening sessions. Um, and because they're at a whole new level, we need to bring in experts to be a part of the collaborative process to build the agendas for these meetings also. So we have already begun planning with uh, Jerry Colonna, who's a known quantity. Uh, he's done uh, lots of work here in Silver Falls for multiple superintendents. He's also, in my opinion, the most respected administrator in the state of Oregon. Um, and he's well known by our, our rural communities as well because of the seven listening and learning sessions we did last year. But we're also bringing in Wenaha Group and most importantly, Jeremy Wright from Wright Public Affairs. This is where he really steps into the picture. So Wenaha got us to this point, to a draft recommendation. Now it turns to the messaging and getting feedback and trying to use this as a formative assessment to come up with a final recommendation that you can feel confident in, that truly uh, has the community's voice attached to it. So Jeremy, who will be going over the polling data with you, will be a major part of our work going forward. You can expect uh, to see his participation really ramping up uh, as well. And so our goal is to, uh, from uh, February 8th, that's the start of our, of our bond feedback sessions, if you will, and we will end in mid-March. And then we will come back together for a fifth meeting of the Bond Advisory Committee in late April. April 17th, I believe, is the week, April 20th, the 20th, which is the week of the 17th, um, to come back and finalize uh, the bond recommendation and to bring it to you during a listening session in May, and then for you to take action at a regular board meeting in June. And you all know that, that whether or not we move forward with this bond is 100% your call as a board. We are here, or I am here to serve you and to make sure you have all the data and information that you need to, to confidently take action. With having said that, um, I'll take any questions that you have uh, regarding the second phase, uh, anything at all, or comments. Second phase or anything? What's that? On the second phase comments or anything? <laughs> anything. Anything but, at this no, point. I, I, I just want to kind of come back to our, you know, 
to, to Hillary and to Dixon, just thank you both for being here. And um, honestly, you got me excited because, um, again, personally, I you know I'm I'm in alignment with, with much of what you you guys said. And Dixon, I'm really glad you um, you and others championed for the high school too because people you know it's the new building, right? It doesn't need any work. It's 25 years old, part of it, and the other one's. 15, 17 years old. It's like saying, well, I'm going to buy a brand new car, Hillary. I'm never going to put new tires on it. That's just not safe. That's not smart. Um, because if you don't put new tires on it, you're going to wreck your rims. You're going to wreck your, your whole uh, alignment. You're going to wreck your whole drivetrain, and you're going to need a new car. It's going to cost you more. Um, that little bit of, uh, I'm not minimizing the amount of dollars that go into the high school, but the, the, the minimal amount of preventative maintenance of what was it, four or five million, I think it was, for this high school is going to save us tens of millions down the future if we don't do something now. So um, uh, I, I appreciate you, you guys championing for the high school, too, because we still need to put money into this business. And it's a real tiny this. part of the bond. Right? Yeah, it Less is. Less than 4%. Well, and, and let's be and honest. That's the messaging. You know, and, and the awesome percent. grant, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The awesome grant, if we can pass this bond, the awesome grant pays for the upgrades to the high school. Yep. There's another little... Right, piece right there. There, there was discussion about Talk. Silver Crest and yeah. fixing or replacing or whatever the seismic grant. And there's some grant money. Yep. If that comes through, then that money yep. can be saved and applied elsewhere. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, no. I, I, I just, I really appreciate uh, the work you did, and, and, and um, you know, I really like the, talking about the what's in it for me. We really have to make sure our district understands that every child, student, you know, every school committee. Uh, community is going to get something out of this bond and 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 future generations too and Scott has even brought up the point that our unborn students right, right. are going to benefit from this um, and but we have to make sure that we're doing a good job in our communities of, of selling the the WIFM, right the what's in it for me um, and, and and that was something that you know I was on the long range facility planning committee and that was a huge piece that came out of that I was like everybody has to feel like they're going to get something out of this so I'm really glad you guys reiterated that and just the concept of, I think this can be a huge rallying point for our community, regardless of belief system, regardless of political ideology, uh, regardless of whether you live uh, outside the city limits or inside the city limits or where your kids go to school. I think th the concept, these are all our kids, right? Um, and we have to kind of say, use this as a rallying point. To, this is our community. We have to do something better for our kids. Um, and I love the stewardship comment because I see this as not, this isn't a tax burden, this is a stewardship yes. investment. Mm -hmm. yes. And um, you know, we just, we just have to use this as a rallying piece for our district. And I, I think, I, I'm confident we can, I really am. So again, thank you f to both of you and to our Winnehaw group too for the work you've done with the, the committee so far and it's still going, um, but uh, excited to hear the, the comments tonight. Thank you, Aaron. Can I add one other thing? I think it's real paramount in messaging when we go out that we really press for the notion that it is one district, it is one group of kids, they're all ours, and um, that you just said something that, that just really struck a chord with me about, um, uh, you said something about the kids and the things, the things that have happened the last couple of years. You said a rallying. This is a rallying for the district and a rallying for the kids. What better time to rally for the kids than after the crap that we've been through oh, yeah. for the last three years? Yeah. What better Absolutely. time? Absolutely. Yeah, I got um, I, uh, uh, I got a comment and then um, uh, and a question for for, for you guys. Um, comment. If this could the fact that we can put a sizable chunk of money to to the rural buildings and in town, we'll just we can kind of put. It will really go a long ways to just putting that thing to bed. Yeah. That's that's just a comment. I just that's been a theme of my watching this happen the whole time. Um, and I'm just curious, have, um, on the second round of polling, you guys notice any changes, or is it kind of anything anything different from round one to round two? You notice anything? We certainly noticed some changes, and and we'll draw your attention to to. Uh, the focal points of that okay. polling data. I think you'll find it really interesting, but nothing earth shattering. Okay. Uh, but I think it will confirm a few things for you. Okay, thanks. 
one thing's for sure, there is a path forward, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. Because the polling data certainly could have told us that you need to shut it down now uh, and come back to the drawing board. So, so it's very positive, and Jeremy will walk us through that. Yeah. Well, I'll weigh in on a few things. The, um, I like the high school, right? So that's, I think that was a really important ad. I'm glad you guys landed there. I think that's gonna be really important. Um, I'll piggyback what Tom just said. I like the fact that it's, I'll just call it roughly equal uh, in terms of the amounts. I think that's gonna go a long ways. Not only is it equal, that just feels good, but it's also, I think just what you said, that amount of money indicates a long-term plan for those buildings. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that will go a long ways mm -hmm. towards easing that, yep. those concerns. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm just agreeing with Tom on that point. Um, th my second comment has more to do, I suspect, with phase two. But one thing you didn't list anywhere as a barrier, but it's, in my circles, one of the most common things I hear, has to do more with the culture wars. People don't want to vote for buildings if they don't like what's being taught to their kids. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to make sure that somehow just stays out of this district to whatever extent as possible. Because I think if we are not careful, all it's going to take is another mask mandate or whatever the thing is that divides everybody. And they're going to say, hell no. Mm -hmm. And they're going to do it for philosophical reasons that haven't got anything to do with the building. So that's more, I guess, to you, Scott, because, you know, sort of as the leader of, of the district. But we have to really, I think, as a district, pay attention to that. 10% of our kids left during COVID. We only got some of them back. I don't know how many of those families are going to vote for a bond. But if we have more of these types of issues that pop up here and there, I just, I don't know how we overcome it. So my, I guess my recommendation as we move through into phase two is that we just be aware that that matters a lot. So I want to see this thing pass and I think that's a critical component at least in the people I know most and, and talk with about this because those are their concerns. The money, yeah everybody doesn't like to pay taxes but that's not their number one beef. I will tell you right now that is not their number one beef. So. When I hear, I hear things that are very congruent, uh, Jonathan, and, and speaking to folks all the time. Uh, one of the things I will say is from the day I started, July 1 of 2020, every single thing that we've done adult action-wise has been driven towards a successful bond. Uh, and that includes the biggest part of our work as a district internally, which is our efforts to reform teaching and learning and to be extremely transparent about a standards-based instructional model. And, and, and by transparent, I mean our curriculum is posted to the public. Our projection maps are on our district website. So if anybody has any questions about what is being taught in our schools, that is a conversation point that is very factual. Um, and so we're making strides to be as transparent as, as we can. We're public servants and we're here to serve the community, not the other way around. Um, and I just want you to know that that is, that is top of my list in terms of how I view the world until we reconcile the most, inc the most mm -hmm. challenging issue regarding the school district, which is its facilities. Where will we put our kids? That's my question to the community. Where? Where will we put them? Because the middle school will not stay up forever. And so we need to reconcile it now. If we don't, costs will get so prohibitive, a bond will never be passed. Right. And then what? Owen, you had a comment. Jonathan, since you brought it up, I, the issue that you brought up is one that I kind of have mentally, personally categorized into a, a a voter that thinks this way, if you don't do what I want you to do, I'm going to vote no. You know, we even had some emails to that effect that said, if you don't, you know, if you take the masks off our kids, I'm going to hurt our kids and vote no. And that's the way I think about a lot of those, um, that we maybe just have to reframe the way we, we talk about it um, and the way we think about the problem and maybe even the way we answer people's questions, you know, that say, 
you know, how can I how can I trust you because people 25 years ago, you know, did something that I think was wrong, and so I'm going to vote, or maybe I'm going to vote no because I just don't have any trust. Those type of issues are, aren't ones that I can probably argue out of, but I can reframe it to be like, well, you're going to hurt kids, fifth, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old kids today because of something that happened 25 years ago. And if you start thinking about it that way, I mean, to me, that is kind of transformational on a lot of these. You know, if you don't support our teachers by giving them everything they ask for, I'm going to vote no. Um, there's so many of those kind of barriers that are out there. Right. And to me, I just think. I just changed the words to, well, if I don't support you there, I'm going to hurt our kids. That's what it comes down to. If you're, if you're voting no, our kids are suffering. I mean, they don't have buildings that are adequate, and a lot of them don't, and, and they're getting worse. And um, So, I mean, the need is clear, and I just think, again, a lot of those barriers, if we reframe our way we're thinking about them um, to that, I don't know, to me, that, that moved me, so for what it's worth. I, I like the idea of reframing it, Owen, and I think my point was primarily just to whatever extent we can keep it from issues from bubbling up and yeah. becoming some new wedge issue, that was, I think, my main point, because I think it matters, because, as I said, money's an element. Trust is bigger by far whatever the for whatever the reason right left middle it doesn't matter but if you don't trust the district to take care of your kids i'm not talking physically in a building i'm talking take care of your kids then you're not going to vote for the bond and that's my point and, and so but i agree if anytime we can reframe and anytime we can keep stick to what we do best which is teach the kids and keep the culture wars out to whatever extent as possible that's my whole that's all i'm trying to say I don't know if we can necessarily keep the culture wars out only because not and I'm just not talking about the people here but I'm also talking about you know the vehicles that feed that right and and it's much larger than us but um, hate is taught I don't think we inherently want to hate and I think certain things are taught generationally and so it goes back to how we've looked at this district in the past and and some of the grudges that are held on and and that is passed down to generations and whatnot so there it, it's going to take a real turn to start seeing things a little differently and start looking more at a horizon that benefits everybody maybe hopefully in my lifetime um, but something that for the sake of education the students everyone that's a part of the district that we are willing to support the bond so we can have something that withstands time because time doesn't stop you know so it and we desperately need it in this district I don't know though how we can always stop the culture wars other than not feed into it probably like you're saying no, but i don't know how we can do that right. I, I mean sometimes it slips in without us we can't control it all i guess well the good news is we only have to have 50 percent of the vote yeah. plus one <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> and our polling data was really promising and that was um in our our meeting on thursday that's what led to this recommendation um it was kind of like the affirming of this recommendation because, like Scott said, there's a, a there's a clear path, and we don't have to have everybody agree. Um, only 50% plus one. Hi, Celeste. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. I'm so sorry I'm late. I That's took okay. my youngest three to the zoo today, oh. and it was such a magical day that I completely forgot that it was Monday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies. But I'm happy to be here. Bye. We've certainly all been there, Celeste, and, and I'm so glad you were able to make it. Uh, Celeste, a couple of things that, that our other Bond Advisory Committee members had shared was their, their experience in terms of how we came to the conclusion around a draft recommendation, and, and Celeste has been a very passionate member of our Bond Advisory Committee, and would you like to share some thoughts, just uh, speak from the heart about your experience in the process, just so our board can... can sure. I doubt that I'll say anything different than what's already been said. 
said. You just said better. <laughs> you have what, 33 children, is it? <laughs> 34. So you, it's important 34. to get your opinions in there. Um, I have six kids, and um, my oldest is a senior here, and um, then my youngest are three-year-old twins. Um, so I have some coming, coming out the gate pretty soon, and um, so I definitely have um, a deep appreciation for our school system as it is, and also am highly invested in its future. Um, I also have a son that's at the middle school right now, and there was a video that was made about the facilities there, and he was highlighted running in the rain from one mm -hmm. class to another. And we didn't know that. <laughs> so um, that's going to go out on Facebook pretty soon uh, <laughs> in this process of advocating for, um, for this bond to pass. Um, I've been really impressed. I've never experienced uh, anything like this before. This is my first, but I've been very impressed. Um, with the way the meetings have been held, with the amount of detail that has gone into um, the research. I'm a historian, I, um, I got a degree in history and uh, really deeply appreciate the details and the research aspect and I know how much time that takes, so I, I really appreciate that. There's been an amazing amount of respectful and diverse dialogue Mm -hmm. um, amongst the group and um, spirited at times and yet also remaining respectful um, and people truly understanding where other people are coming from and it helping them to understand better. Um, and also there have been questions, hard questions asked um, that they have uh, done a wonderful job coming back and, and having good answers for. So I, I really feel like I've appreciated being able to be a part of the whole process and um, I'm definitely ready to actively move forward in advocating for this and doing everything that I can in our community to, to see it pass. And if that means setting up a political action committee or, or anything that I can do in that process, then I will do it as long as people can have patience with me not remembering which <laughs> day it is. <laughs> we can work with that. A day, a day at the zoo with your kids is priceless. How, how many of those do you get? I think something Celeste just said is really crucial moving forward. And what was so cool about this advisory committee is it was very representative of the community. Jonathan, I get exactly what you're saying. I, that is an issue. We kind of separated that thought from the fact that this is a facilities thing. That's another thing that needs to be addressed. But what I think is really important, it was such a representative group. And when we all at the end said, can you support it? And then we had a three, four, five. Okay. Five is enthusiastic support. And three was, eh, it's not perfect, but I can support it. We pretty much all agreed support means going out and advocating for it, not mm -hmm. just saying, oh, yeah, yeah and not doing anything about it. <laughs> but as Celeste said, going forward, advocating for it, everybody there was ready to go out and even those that said, this isn't perfect, but I can live with it and I'll support it and I'll work for it. And I think that's an important message. I say one last thing? Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's, it just came to me. Um, and, it, and one refrain I hear from certain folks in the community is, you know, well, you know, we have this shotgun approach to, to school buildings. We have all these little buildings. Uh, we don't need all of these little buildings. We don't need all of these little schools. And my counter to that now, and I am a convert, is I don't, uh, where are those kids going to go? There is nowhere else. We need every classroom that we have, no matter what school it is at. Um, we are at, as far as I know, maximum capacity in most of our school buildings. Um, so it, it's not a question anymore of like, oh, you know, close these schools down and, but to save money. That's a scarcity mindset. Um, we are a wealthy community. And by that, I mean, we have a wealth of, of human resources, of people, of brains. Um, we should not be scrabbling about the place where we send our babies every day. That should be something we are happy to spend money on as long as it's being spent on the most important things. And I, I really do believe that what we've come up with are uh, the most important things. 
Thank you, Hillary. So we're going to uh, shift gears here and, and bring in uh, Jeremy Wright. Uh, he's uh, attending virtually, and he's going to run through a very similar uh, presentation in terms of structure that you received the f after the first round of polling. This one's a lot different. The questions were different. It was designed differently because now we have price points and other things that we could, we could touch on. So uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for, for being here, and, and I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, let me see if I can uh, start. Oh, I need to be able to share my screen and be given the power. There we go. All right, yeah. Pardon me. Looking for the. Can everyone see my screen and hear me? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. So, uh, as was just outlined, that you know, we did this poll is very different from what we did for you in the fall. In the fall, the poll we did was a state of the um, district poll, so it was more touching on kind of the, the community's perceptions of your school district. Um, and less on the facilities and the, you know, the bond development. And we did that because we wanted to make sure and understand how your community saw your, your sees your district and if there were any potential issues we, that would be better to be addressed now rather than later or in the fall rather than later. Um, as some, some folks in the discussion have talked about with the hot button uh, social issues. So, uh, this poll was all about giving the Bond Development Committee tools to finalize and refine um, their bond recommendation that you, you've seen tonight. So to quickly go over what we did, uh, we made we did a sample of 400 likely voters. Again, we called them using uh, cell, you know, you calling both cells, cell, cells and landlines. Uh, and we conducted those interviews earlier here in January, January 10th to the 13th. Uh, just want to remind everyone there's a uh, margin of error here. So when you see small number of differences, just remember there's about you know almost 5%, 4.9% margin, margin of error. So some of these small uh, subgroup things will aren't necessarily statistically significant. Uh, we diminished the voter file sample um, to reflect a November 2023 electorate. And what does that mean? Uh, the poll we did in the in fall, we actually called everyone who is uh, a voter in the a registered voter in the Silver Falls School District. Not everyone, but our, our universe of people we were dialing to get to that 400 sample was all um, likely voter, uh, voters, registered voters in the Silver Falls School District. What we did this time, though, is we really wanted to narrow down that info for you. Um, and so we diminished the electorate to reflect what a November 2023 um, group of voters looks like. And that group of voters is different from all your registered voters because, you know, you're looking at a much smaller turnout uh, when you're talking about uh, a November 2023 election versus all registered voters. So we just pulled this demographic slide for you so you could see the difference. So uh, you, know, you have a district where about half of all voters are under age 50 and the other half are over 50. Um, you have a district where about 53% of voters are in the city of Silverton and 47% everywhere else. Um, you'll see the, uh, the registration, 27% Dems, 38% uh, non-affiliated and 35% Republican. But in the right column here is like, what, what is the November 2023 electorate? Hey, Jeremy. Look? Yeah. I don't think we're looking at the slide you're talking about. Oh. What slide are you seeing right now? Perceptions of school facilities lean negative is on the, the header. Oh, that's really weird. Let me, I apologize. Is that, this is the, oh. hold on for a sec. Uh, let me hold back up. Are you presenting on another monitor? Yeah, by yeah it could be that, hold on. Let me try again. I apologize, everyone. I was wondering too. Thank you, John. Yeah, 
you were like, uh, Jeremy, what are you talking about? <laughs> I apologize. Now, do you guys see the methodology on your screen now? Yep. 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 Okay. Sorry about are you, that. Are you able to put it in presentation mode so it's a little yeah. bit bigger for us? Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Try and do it. There you go. Is that a little bigger for y'all? That's great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Apologize. Uh, you think three years into this, we would have it all dialed in. But um, so I just walked through this verbally with this slide. This slide is what I was just walking through verbally uh, about your demographics. And so on the left is your registered voter. So everyone in your district in the right is likely November 23 voters. So you can see the difference. Um, and likely November 2023 voters are people who vote in like over every election. It's gonna be about 25% of your electorate. Um, and so, you know, we can expect a turnout around 25, 30%. So you see there's more women than men. You'll see it's a much older uh, group of voters than, uh, and I, I, I've called, I'm paying attention to this specifically because it's important to understand when we go out into the community and talk about this and think about how you are gonna pass this, that you understand that who we're talking to is different from all the, your entire community uh, in terms of how to win this. So we have an older electorate. Um, it's a little more, it's 50-50 it's balance between city of Silverton and the rest of the district. Uh, Non-affiliated voters are a much smaller part of it. And this is really common. Um, people who tend to be in parties are uh, much more um, electorally active. And so you'll see here that non-affiliated voters, why they're the largest single group, those are also called independents colloquially, a large, large, largest single group in your entire uh, district, uh, they actually are in a November election only gonna be about 20%. So we, the numbers you see tonight are gonna be reflected in this right-hand column. Those are the people, uh, the demographics that we, uh, we talked to. So where do we start? What we wanted to do out of the gate was actually ask a, uh, um, a mocked up version of your ballot language. And ballot language is important because this is exactly what people or a version of what people will see. And you only get 10 words for the caption and 20 words for the question. So on the right here, you see what we ask. Bonds to increase safety, repair schools, replace Silverton Middle School. That's your 10 word ca caption. And your question was, shall district increase safety, repair all schools, replace middle school, issue $138 million in general obligation bonds, audits required. Having heard this, would you vote yes or no? And what you see is that I'll, you know, we start out with a 43 to 33 uh, plurality of support, but you have a whole chunk of people who don't know. And so if throughout this presentation, you'll see a lighter color of blue and a lighter color of pink and then a dark, and that's intensity of support. And so, you know, you have a lot of, it's lightly held views in general. People, we have a big chunk of don't know, a quarter of people don't know. And then, you know, even though, you know, you have more supporters on yes than no, uh, that's also lightly held. So there's a whole bunch of opinion here that isn't something that's dead set out of the gate. They haven't heard a whole lot about this. And this is the first time they've probably been asked about it. Um, and so, you know, it's not unusual to see this level of don't know or light support. Going to the next one. And who are these people? Um, we do much, and this is the on the right, far right column here is the margin uh, of support for these various demographics. Um, we do much better with out of the gate with women. Younger voters are far more um, supportive than older. Um, college educated voters are far more supportive than non college education. Renters typically have been, are always stronger supporters because they don't see their property tax bill. and understand that connection. So those are, you know, uh, in, uh, in terms of party affiliation, we do much better with Democrats, non-affiliated, Republicans, very much underwater um, in the initial ask. You do better in the city of Silverton proper versus outside. Uh, and current school district parents are incredibly supportive, not surprising. Um, and but we still want to see that number to get even higher. We want to move to 16% all the way up because we know that they are some of our key targets. And people who've never had a kid in school are less supportive out of the gate of this $138 million bond. None of these numbers are really that different from what we see in a lot of places. It's kind of typical patterns, except of course your regional is very unique too. 
your district. And then what we did is, and I'm not gonna read all of this, but what we did was we gave them an in English explanation, the elevator pitch. So we had kind of the tortured bond ballot language that we have to, um, that will people, every voter will see on their ballot. And what this is, is gives you the, you know, what exactly are they buying? And it's all about critical needs and what's happening, you know, with the, you know, leaky basements and roofs and uh, safety and security and replacing so with the middle school. Very importantly in this, we also, you see at the end, tell them the cost per thousand. So this is the first time we say, okay, this is the what it's gonna cost you, $1.53 per uh, thousand. And you'll see here's the difference. Um, this is where we uh, pick up significant opposition. So you are you pick up about three points in support, but 10, 10, 10 percentage points in opposition. And later on in the poll, we go through a whole list, and I'll show you of, of the actual items that we talk about in that that England English ex, um, explanation before. And people really like all the items you're doing the struggle is going to be that they don't want to pay for them. This is, again, not a that unusual of occurrence, but this is, you know, this is where, you know, we have to, uh, we're going to have to really make the case. It's telling me that you're going to have to really make the case around cost and price sensitivity uh, with such a large jump as soon as we give them the price for a thousand. So from there, uh, what we wanted to do is test for the bond development committee actual price point sensitivity, and then uh, the, the items that you're considering putting in the bond. We tested 138 million. And what we said here is that this is going to do um, make critical repairs at every school in the district, increase student and staff safety, and replace all buildings that go to the middle school with section of the gym. Um, this bond is estimated to cost $1.53. And then we said 110 million, which is a smaller bond, this would fund the replacement of all uh, all the buildings at Silverton Middle School, with the exception of the gym. Uh, however, some plan and then go through some of the top priority repairs. However, some improvements planned in the larger bond we just discussed would not include in, occur, like stormwater damage and plumbing upgrades, replacement of energy efficient windows, etc. This bond is estimated to cost property owners additional eighty-eight cents. And finally, we did the smallest bond, which would just do the middle school with the only the highest priority, top priority repairs. In, um, in security needs across the district. And that would cost them 68 cents per thousand. And what we found is that we didn't pick up any much support the cheaper we got. Uh, you'll see here on the left that, you know, the 138 had about 44%, um, had 44% support. And then we have 41 and 43, nothing statistically significant. And then we, our opposition remained about the same. The one thing I want to point out here, though, is that there is definitely uh, the lowest price point had the much higher no, not strongly um, than the highest price point. The highest price point engendered more strong no, 29% um, you know, of people were no strongly. So like stronger opposition to the larger number. What I told the bond development group, though, is that I think at the end of the day, the probability of picking up a good chunk of this 46%, whether it's 138 or 101, is very low. That this campaign is going to be won around that 10% to 12% of undecideds, and we see that later in the poll. Um, we're not moving. You're going to have about 45, 46% of your community at the end of the day are just not, do not want to increase their taxes. Um, and that's going to be, you know, <laughs> it's going to be a pretty marginal number, what this tells me, of voters who we're going to need to move. I think you can move a few of these, no, not strongly, um, but it's going to be pretty limited. Uh, and so there, you don't really get much from lowering your bond amount. Uh, we typically would recommend the smaller number if it showed a greater increase in support. All it did was bring increase in less vehement opposition, I guess is a way to put it, uh, which isn't really for, you know, kind of thinking about how you put together a bond and bond campaign doesn't give you a lot. Uh, and so that's why, uh, I, you know, the, the bond advisory committee went forward with the 138. <laughs> Uh, and, and you know that's always not the, that's not always the case. I want to make clear 
Um, there's times where people pick up dramatic amount of support when you drop it by half, right? You went from a buck 53 to 68 cents. This surprised us because in some places you drop that by half, people move and you, you pick up significant um, support. In this case, that wasn't the case. And then what we did was test the actual items. And then there was a whole battery of questions around um, these things you're considering placing in the bond. And you know what I want to emphasize is that your voters want warm, safe, and dry things done for the kids. And so whether it's uh, safety, getting rid of asbestos, and someone was talking about black mold, um, basic repairs uh, to your plumbing, your roofs, fire safety, um, meeting, making accessibility for ADA requirements, very positive. All these items we tested on are your top tier things, which was uh, fix the buildings, make them warm, safe, dry, secure, I should say secure and safe and secure as well. Those are the things that people really wanted to uh, you to do. And your second tier items aren't bad at all. This isn't like, just as we say second tier, it doesn't mean don't include them because they all have very high net favorability ratings, but they're more the safety and security we just talked about addressing size and construction changes at Silvercrest. Um, you see down here, replacing Silverton Middle School. Uh, that wasn't incredibly, uh, that wasn't as popular as some of the other items we tested. It is important to note though, and I wanna emphasize this for all the board members, when we talk about replacing Silverton Middle School, you have to couple it with talking about the issues. So talk about the specific things we are improving or replacing there, not to say, we're replacing the middle school. That doesn't mean anything to people. So you have to talk about why you're replacing the middle school. And it's the fact that we have a condemned building there. We have place spaces that kids can't go. We have water intrusion. We have you know classrooms that are 100 degrees in the summer and can't you know be locked. Whatever, all the different ways you can point out the problems are it's absolutely crucial. Don't just say replace over the middle school. Uh, and then finally, the two things that were not particularly popular. It doesn't mean that they're fatal. They're gonna, gonna like tank your bond, um, but that it was adding uh, covered players to every school and adding a gym. So people just didn't see this as a higher priority. They really wanted you to take care of the basics first. Um, and if maybe you could get to this, um, that would be nice. But these, these are not um, things that I think there's kind of a, you know, kids can play in the rain kind of mentality there. <laughs> And then the final thing we did was uh, ask a final question. Now that you've heard, we've had, we've talked to you for 12, 13 minutes. Uh, and having heard more about this, here's how much it's going to cost. Will you support? And you see the movement and we get to 50%. So the comment about there's a path, there is. Uh, it's going to be a, uh, you know, a tight, tough, narrow one. Uh, I won't sugarcoat it for you. But I think you know that with your community that we're going to have to really make the case um, around, you know, why should we tax us a significant tax um, to improve your school? Uh, I think you see here that talking about the problems at each school, really detailing out how you're going to make those improvements, detailing how we're doing the basics, not the fancy stuff, um, and taking care of our buildings. Uh, for future kids coming through, it's going to be the, the your your path in in terms of messaging, and we're we're going to continue to emphasize that. I'll stop there. That's the end of the presentation. Questions for Jeremy? So you mentioned a four point nine percent margin of error. In your experience, how closely do these sort of early numbers tend to trend with sort of reality? In other words. I mean, 43 and 50 sound really promising, but I think if each could be off by 5%, you could swap the two technically, right? So yep. my question is how, in your experience, do, does it tend to trend pretty close to these early polls? Um, I think it's, these early polls are more about giving you a sense of kind of the overall um, feel of the community. I would pay more attention to the price point sensitivity stuff, the, uh, the um, project uh, uh, prioritization stuff that we did there. Um, these are, I, I like to pay, polls are a snapshot in time, time. So 
I'm more interested probably in the final one would do for you before you go do the ballot, right? Um, that's a little closer to the election day. But to answer your question, if you know we're sitting at these similar numbers in our last poll for you in August or whenever we choose to do it uh, before the filing deadline, you know, they hear Hugh, Hugh pretty close. Um, the one thing I will say is that we typically see undecided late break, probably three to one towards a no vote. Um, so don't anticipate like sharing this undecided. You're going to lose more undecided and win. Um, but typically it's not, it's not off by four or five. It's going to be off by one, two or three um, percent. Um, but these are really early numbers. We haven't done anything in the community. Um, you just had somebody captured on the phone for 12 to 13 minutes. So that part's a little unrealistic in terms of modeling, but we also have done no education. So uh, I would be, I'm super interested to see where we go uh, in, in, but at the end of the day, I think your community is going to be a 5248 victory. So I would be a betting man. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I'm just wondering, are we going to pull, sorry, are we going to pull between the end of the feedback sessions in March and our board decision in June? Is that uh, so there was one final poll planned, and that's a messaging and snapshot poll, right? That gives us where we test more messaging, less this project priorities. Uh, we, I, we could we could poll in June before you make your decision, um, or we could wait. Your your the, the board to action is one thing, and then the district, uh, the district has to technically file by August, I believe, fifteenth. And that is like the filing deadline. So you could wait, do a motion, and then choose to poll in early August um, before the actual paperwork has to be turned into your county elections uh, to place on the ballot. It's really up to the district, up to the board. Are you comfortable? Do you want to poll before you take a public board vote? Or would you you're fine taking an action, understanding that you could poll a little, a little closer to the election, but before the filing deadline um, to get a that I just like to be as close to the election day as possible because it's as close to the, the, the conditions um, that we'll be uh, uh, voting under. Okay. That, that makes sense. Your, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And we're at your service. If the board believes that uh, you'd like to get uh, some more data before uh, June, then we can talk about that too. Um, Again, we're relying on Jer Jeremy and his expertise to know uh, when exactly to pull and how that data will be the most useful for you. Yeah. Other questions, concerns, comments? Yeah, Scott, I just wanted to mention, um, forgive me if you mentioned it, Jeremy, but we have about 13,000 registered voters in the district. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that an odd year election obviously would be a, a lesser turnout. So they'd expect about a 30% turnout, which would be 4,000 voters and approximately 1,200 of those that would be Silver, Silver Falls parents. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, so Steve. What does that break down to each 1% how many voters? Each, each one? You need what, 40, 40, 40 votes for each 1%? On 1% is the 40 yeah. votes in an election like that? Yeah. And this will be one on the margins. Yeah. So yeah. that, that uh, may sound, you know, uh, outlandish, but it's you know pretty real. So we need to be thinking about it in that in those terms. Yeah, and in, in district your size, you know, we can really engage in what you know that retail politics. And you guys, this board knows us from running for office. You have a lot, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and have a lot of what I love to call two-way conversations instead of just pushing material out into the universe. You use the material to have. Um, conversation, you know, have, you know, answer people's questions and you can do that. Um, it's a lot of hard work, but it's going to be what we need to do. And Jeremy will have a lot of, Jeremy will have a lot of advice going forward about how yeah, we approach absolutely. that. Yeah. And I'll just say that what, you know, the, we talked, I heard the discussion about the listening sessions. And I think the whole goal here is to give the community, the larger community opportunity to give us feedback as well. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change your the, what this hard work that's been done to date, but it does, it's just another, like this polling is a quantitative uh, point of 
uh, it, you know, you know, quantitative uh, data point, but you need qualitative as well to be this kind of taking the time to do the feedback. And um, even if, you know, I always say, you know, make sure you ask people for their opinion before you ask for their money. Um, and I think that's the whole goal. Um, and to give people real detailed information about what you're proposing, there might be some things in there you didn't consider, or there might be a messaging point that could be helpful. Um, all these things are, you know, I, I commend the district for taking the time to do what you're about to embark on in the next couple months, um, just because it's a it's an important step um, that gives you uh, it, uh, cover and understanding of people's opinions on this issue in more depth than, you know, just going to the ballot, so. Any other questions? That's sharing there. Jeremy. Okay, Jeremy. thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Anything else from, from our friends at Wenaha? No? Thank you to our, our Bond Advisory Committee members, again, taking time out of their day, not only for all four of the meetings, and we have a fifth one coming up in the spring, but also spending their Monday evening with us as well to share their thoughts. This truly is, this truly is their decision. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Well, we are moving towards our um, executive session. So now we're going to move after the the room clears. We're going to move into executive session under ORS one nine two dot 6602D to con conduct deliberations with persons designated to carry on labor negotiations and ORS 192.6602F to consider information or records that are exempt by law from public inspection, a sick leave bank request. Are we all good to go straight into executive session? Yep. Okay. We are now um, opening back up into regular session to consider a sick leave bank request. Is there a motion? Yes, I would move that the board approve a sick leave bank of 20 days for Letitia PD. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve a sick leave bank request for Letitia PD. Any discussion? All right, let's vote. <coughs> Jonathan? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Janet? Yes. Owen? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Lori? Yes. All in favor? All right, without objection, meeting adjourned. Yes.